Drug use is a worldwide issue, but the prescription drug situation is desperate in the United States. While only about 5% of the world's population lives in the U.S., we consume more than 80% of all prescription drugs consumed in the entire world. That is a serious problem. 100 people die every day from drug overdoses in the U.S. Every day. How many people are in this room right now? And these people, they're gone forever because they started with just one little pill. Ohio has a significant prescription drug problem. Every year, doctors prescribe enough pills for every man, woman, and child in Ohio to have almost 70 doses. That's nearly 70 pills per person. One out of every five Ohio high school students say they have used a prescription drug that was not prescribed to them by a doctor. More than half of them said they didn't even know what they were taking. Every day, 2,700 teens in the U.S. abuse a prescription drug for the first time. And eight out of 10 of those teens get the drug from a friend or a relative, not a doctor. More people die in Ohio from accidental overdoses each year than do in car crashes. In fact, four people die in Ohio from an accidental overdose every day. That's one person dead every six hours. Gone forever. Look around you. One person gone every six hours. How long until this room is empty? So we put this together a couple years ago and these numbers are changing really fast. So right now, it's 197 people die in the United States every day due to a drug overdose. When we first started doing it, it was four people in the state of Ohio. Then it went to six, then it went to 10, then it's at 12, now it's at 15. 15 people every single day die due a drug overdose in, the, in Ohio, in our state. And all trends are this thing's not gonna peak till we get around 25 or 30. That's the trends, what's going on. So how did we get here? So let's talk a little bit about prescription pain pills. Anybody ever hear of Vicodin, Percocet, Tramadol, Oxycontin, okay? All those opiates respond in your body just like heroin, just like heroin, okay? So how do we get an opiate? Most of the time, uh, our kids are getting them because maybe they went to the dentist, had their wisdom teeth taken out, okay? Doctor gives Vicodin, all right? Sometimes have a surgery, car accident, okay? Um, those, are, those are most of the time how our kids are getting them. But sometimes they get them out of parents' medicine cabinets or grandparents' medicine cabinets, okay? So we need to understand the stat Four out of five heroin users first began with the use of opiate prescription pain pills. Four out of five. Show you the Every 19 minutes, we lose one life in this country to a prescription drug overdose. I am the face of addiction. One out of five high school students have admitted to using prescription drugs without a prescription. Prescription drug addiction has been deemed an epidemic. Every day on average, 2,500 teens use prescription drugs to get high for the first time. I am the face. 60% of teens who abuse prescription pain relievers did so before the age of 15. Prescription drug dependency can lead to heroin addiction. Heroin produces the same high, but for a fraction of the cost. Most parents are in denial. They don't think that prescription drug abuse and addiction can happen to their child. Most teens experiment with prescription drugs found in their family's medicine cabinet. Prescription drugs used other than their intended purposes can be deadly. Prescription drug addiction knows no boundaries. It doesn't matter if you live on Park Avenue or on the park bench. 56% of teens believe that prescription drugs are easier to get than illicit drugs. Prescription drug overdoses have surpassed annual youth deaths by suicide, death by firearms, school violence, and car accidents. Driving under the influence of drugs has surpassed drunk driving for the first time ever. Every year, 23 million people need treatment from alcohol abuse and drug addiction. Denial is as deadly as the disease. If you think this couldn't happen to your child, you couldn't be more wrong. We are experiencing an epidemic. 
The vaccine for this epidemic is awareness and education. I am the face. 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 I am the face of addiction. I am the face. 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 I am the face of addiction. So every one of those kids had somebody in their family that was struggling with the disease of addiction, maybe a parent or a big brother or, or sister. And so each one of you, when you came in here today, you had an image in your mind of what you think a heroin addict looks like. And my challenge to you today is to put an image in your mind that he looks just like you. He looks just like your son. He looks just like your daughter, okay? And so I'm gonna kind of share our story uh, real fast with you to kind of tell you a little bit about Tyler, okay? So Tyler graduated in 2009. He was a mega cum laude graduate from Lake High School. He was an all league and all county golfer. He actually recorded two hole in ones before he turned 16 years old. His senior year, he decided not to play golf, but to go out for the football team. At the end of the season, he earned the Senior Ironman Award. After high school and not playing competitive golf for over two years, he walked on the golf team at Walsh University, where he earned a golf and academic scholarship. In 2013, he did a bodybuilding show. And at the age of 22, he was announced runner-up junior Mr. Ohio. How does a kid like Tyler get addicted to heroin? How does a kid like Tyler get addicted to heroin? So Tyler broke his right arm four times. He had two surgeries on his right elbow. The first surgery was at age 11, and the second surgery was at age 18. The picture in the, in the middle there is from Children's Hospital at the age of 11. They did a feature presentation on Tyler's surgery uh, because he got all of his mobility and everything back in his elbow. So Tyler has two surgeries, first one at age 11, second one at age 18. Ultimately, he gets addicted to the opiate prescription pain pills. Four out of five heroin users first began with the use of opiate prescription pain pills. I'll show you this next video. A man's body was found in a parking lot, and authorities are trying to figure out what happened to him. The body was found in a vacant lot on Alfred Road in Coventry Township this morning. The Summit County Medical Examiner is trying to determine his identity and how he died. Authorities say that drug paraphernalia was found near the body, and autopsy is expected tomorrow. So on September 28, 2014, Tyler was in the process of overdosing. And the person he was with, instead of calling 911 for help, he took my son to a vacant lot and he dumped him in the field and he left him there to die. The next day, the Summit County Sheriff showed up at my house and proceeded to tell my wife and 17-year-old daughter that a resident found a dead body in a vacant lot and it was our 23-year-old son. What do you do, what do you do when all your hopes and dreams are left in a field to die? What do you do? Who are you as a person? So look, we share our story not to scare you. That's not, that's not our intent, okay? We share our story to try to bring awareness and get this conversation going, okay? Because this is happening all across our state and all across our country every single day. Every single day. So let me show you this next clip. So here's, here's the big debate. And so this is where we're just going to get really open and honest, and we're just going to have a real conversation. So here's the big debate. Is addiction a choice, or is it a disease? Right? So let me ask you. You think it's a choice? Raise your hand. You think it's a disease? Raise your hand. Okay, so look. That's the culture shift we have to do as a society. And this is kind of the way I say this thing, Okay. If it's a choice, then our response as a community is going to be, you knucklehead, knock it off. We're never going to invest time, resources, or money into bad behavior. But if it's a disease, like we all know it is, then we're going to respond like we do with every other disease, and that's with love and compassion. And until we start doing that as a community, we're not going to solve this epidemic. Okay? 
I sat in shame for five years before I told anybody about my story. It was everything I could do just to talk to my wife and just to talk to my kids because I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I thought I failed as a father, okay, because I didn't understand addiction as a disease, okay? So I was the father who blew it, okay? And it wasn't until after Tyler died that I had to own my story because it's on the front page of the paper. It's on, it's on the news, okay? And now I have no choice but to own what's going on, okay? So let me, uh, let me explain this to you real quick. So my challenge to you is, and I think you guys already got it, okay? But no one, no one chooses addiction. No one, okay? And that debate's got to stop. Okay, so let me just explain to you how addiction works. I'm not a doctor, okay, but I've done these kind of uh, events a lot. I've had plenty of opportunities to spend time with doctors. I've been given uh, lots of opportunities to be on panels and uh, discussions. So here's how addiction works in your brain. So you reason with the front part of your brain. I put my hand on the stove, I'm going to burn myself. I reason with the front part of my brain. When I'm in active addiction, I'm driven by the inner core of my brain that says I'm going to drown, I'm going to suffocate, I'm going to die unless I feed my addiction, and I can't reason. And that's why it's called a chronic brain disease. Okay? My brain's broke. All right? And so, therefore, I lie, cheat, and steal to feed my addiction because I can't reason. And as a community, all we do is we see the bad behavior. All we do is we see the bad behavior. And I'm not condoning the bad behavior. I'm not condoning that. I'm trying to explain to you why the person responds the way they do. They're sick, their brain is broke. And what we have to do is respond with love and compassion. So let me show you this next clip. Look at this. And this is something that we all need to be paying attention to as parents, okay? 90% of everybody who struggles with substance abuse started using before 18. So if you got a kid in high school, if you got a kid in junior high school, you need to be having these kind of conversations. Okay? Show the next clip. So these are some things that parents can do and that you need to be doing. And I'm not here to tell you how to be a parent. That's not what I'm trying to do. Okay? But I do want to challenge you to get this conversation going in your home. Okay? You need to be challenging your son or your daughter or your grandson or your granddaughter to not be using any, any substance, alcohol or drugs. The adolescent brain doesn't mature to about 25. We already don't make good decisions. We're already not real good at that behavior, okay? And then we're going to start throwing alcohol or drugs on top of it, all right? You need to set clear goals and expectations with your, with your family, with your kids, Okay? No consumption. None. Zero. Okay? If, in fact, you go to the doctor and your doctor prescribes you an opiate because you had a surgery or uh, you go to the dentist or whatever, you need to be having those kind of conversations with the doctor. Okay? And I'll just give you an example. My youngest daughter had her wisdom teeth taken out when she was uh, uh, in high school. The doctor gave her 40 Vicodin. 40, not four or five, but 40, okay? That, was, that script was enough to throw her into active addiction, that one script, okay? Now, of course, it, now we're, we're educated on this thing a little bit, and that didn't happen. So my challenge to you is this. If you, got a, if you get a script for the doctor, you need to challenge him. You need to say, listen, I don't need 40 pills. Maybe I need two or three to get through the initial surgery, okay? The first 72 hours is the most important time if you have some type of uh, surgery. After 72 hours, you probably don't need an opiate, okay? So, you know, obviously pay attention to your medicine. We have uh, some deterra bags in the back when you leave. So these deterra bags is you put the unused script in this bag, you put some water in it, and it dissolves the medicine, and then you can just throw it away, okay? So as parents, if you have these opiates in your home, grandparents, take these bags home, get this medicine out of your house, okay? And that's the best way to do it. 
And what we do is we think we got to save this medicine because when my back flares up again, I got to have I got to have the script. The problem is your son or daughter might come in and take that medicine or your grandchild, okay? So I challenge you to get that medicine out of your home, all right? And then the, you know, the, the other thing is you, you just got to get this conversation going. That, I mean, as a community, as a society, as parents, we got to start having these real conversations, okay? Let me show you the next clip. So look, listen to this number. In 2015, 127,500 Americans died to drugs, alcohol, or suicide. That's 350 people a day, 14 people every hour, one person every four minutes dies to drugs, alcohol, or suicide in the United States. We have a pain problem. We have a pain problem. So this is where, you know, I, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. I'll show you this next clip. So after high school, I gave up the opportunity to play college football and volunteer and enlist in the United States Marine Corps. Spent four years of active duty in the Marine Corps. When I was in the Marine Corps, we had this saying, pain is beautiful, extreme pain is extremely beautiful, right? Because we knew we had to embrace some pain in our life to get the mission done. Any veterans in the room? Every veteran in the room knows that, right? So look, here's my challenge. Life is painful. Life is difficult. We all have pain in our life. Now listen, I'm not coming to you from a person in recovery, okay? I'm coming to you because my son was dumped in a field and left there to die. So I understand a little bit about pain, right? I got a feeling for some pain. And what I've had to learn in my life over the last four years is I've had to embrace the pain in my life. It's not comfortable. I don't like it. I don't like our story, okay? But if I don't embrace the pain, here's what, here's what we do as a society. We think we should be pain-free, right? We think we should be pain-free, so we drown our pain with alcohol, we numb it with pills or drugs, or we lose all hope and commit suicide. We have a suicide epidemic right now, right here in Stark County, okay? What we know about the disease of addiction and mental health it's all surrounding form of trauma or pain, okay? Whether that pain is physical pain, spiritual pain, mental or emotional pain, it's all surrounding pain. And so as a community, as a society, my challenge to you is I think we need to embrace the pain in our life. We gotta do the, do the tough things, so think about this. We grow in our pain. We grow in our pain. Life is painful. Next clip. That's my big painful story. <laughs> All right, can you stop that real quick, Laura, real quick? Okay, so listen. Um, this next video I'm going to share with you, it's about three or four minutes. And it's, it's kind of our journey. So we just put this together. We have just got this together in the last the month or so. And so to kind of tell you a little bit about Hope United and what we're trying to do, so uh, two years after Tyler died, my wife and I founded Hope United, and it's based on three pillars. And those pillars are education, support, and recovery. So the education piece is kind of like this. We get out, we speak at schools, we speak in the community, we speak at churches, we speak at companies. Um, I'll speak wherever you want me to go. And try to get the conversation moving, okay? To try to break down the stigma that's associated with the disease of addiction. Okay, and as a community, we got to understand this thing. So that's the educational piece. The support piece is my wife has a couple support groups. One, specifically for families who have lost a child or lost a loved one. That's called the well, okay? We also have a support group for families who are in active addiction, okay? When we were in active addiction, we sat in shame. We were afraid to raise our hand, okay? Really me, not my wife, really me, okay? Um, and, and we know that we made a lot of mistakes because we didn't understand this thing. So these support groups is we kind of, we tried to embrace our pain, okay? And, and, and what I learned about the well, and it's, it's mainly moms that come to this, okay? There's a group of about 15 that come to the well. And what I learned about that group is 
as they started encouraging each other and they started supporting each other and sharing in each other's pain, people began to heal. And people started to doing little things to try to push back. Okay? The other pillar is the recovery piece. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Okay? So education, support, and recovery are the three pillars of Hope United. The recovery piece looks like this for us. Okay? We learned a lot of lessons the hard way, okay? So Tyler could never get a year of sobriety under his belt. He could get six months, he could get eight months, but he could never get a year. So we learned how important that first year is, okay? So listen to this number. 70% of people who go through traditional treatment, 30, 60, 90 days, 70% are gonna relapse in the first year. 70%, okay? So look, I'm not a real smart guy, but you know, I can say 70% is a pretty high failure, right? And that's our traditional treatment, 30, 60, 90 days, 30, 60, 90 days. 70% of the people are gonna go through that program and fail. We gotta do something different. We gotta do something different, okay? So look, with the disease of addiction, you don't get screwed up in 30, 60, 90 days, and you're not going to get fixed in 30, 60, 90 days, okay? So we're, one of the things that we're working on is to establish Ohio's first ever relapse prevention wellness center. So our program wants to pick up right where traditional treatment leaves off. So it would be an outpatient setting, so as soon as you come out of your 30, 60, 90 day treatment, we will have programs in place for you to continue on with counseling, to continue on with therapy, to tend to continue on with dealing with your pain. Because look, once you get through the professional counseling, until you reach the root cause of your addiction, which is some form of pain, you're not gonna get into long-term sobriety. Any person in recovery will tell you that, okay? Every person in recovery will tell you, I didn't really move until I went to the root cause of my pain, okay? And so we gotta start treating pain differently. And that's part of the wellness center and the things that we're gonna do, okay? So let me show you this, this, this video. We are on a journey. It's hard to say when it began. It may have started here, in the midst of a heroin overdose. My son, Tyler, is left here to die. Only 23 years old, he takes his last breath in this field. Maybe our journey begins here. Tyler is 10. He suffers an injury to his arm during a wrestling match and is prescribed opioids to manage his pain. It's hard to say when it began, but we know exactly where we're going. We want you to join us. The stigma associated with addiction is crippling to those battling the disease and to their families. But we saw that the more we opened up to people, the easier it was for people to share their own stories and take comfort in the support of their community. At one point, the journey takes us back here. Shelly wants to buy this land and build a place where our community can support those who are also on a journey, one of recovery. In addition to our efforts to raise awareness, we begin raising money to fund her vision for the field. This is our journey. We raise over $1.4 million, but we soon determined that this property is too small for building a self-sustaining, long-term relapse prevention wellness center. In October of 2017, Summit County Council graciously donated 10 acres of land 
which we will use to build Tyler's Redemption Place, where members of our community can continue their journey to recovery, a place that picks up where traditional providers leave off. Most recovery programs provide treatment for 30, 60, or 90 days. Tyler's Redemption Place will serve our community by providing long-term care to people on their journey to recovery. This will be a place where people can come together to break down barriers and destroy the stigma associated with the disease of addiction. And all members of our community will have the ability to utilize this state-of-the-art health and wellness facility. This is Tyler's Redemption Place. So that's our big goal, okay? It's a $3.7 million build. We've raised over a million five so far, okay? And, um, you know, we're actively out there trying to raise the money to be able to build Tyler's Redemption Place, okay? Um, let me, let me, let me uh, share this with you and, and kind of challenge you. One of the things I've learned over my life, and um, again, I learned everything the hard way, and I would kind of challenge you this way. Life is painful, and I can't control the events or the circumstances that happen in my life. The only thing I really can control is my response, is my response. And so what Shelly and I and our family is trying to do is to take the single worst thing that could ever happen to a family or to a parent and try to make something good come out of it, okay, by controlling our response, okay? And so my challenge to you today is to control your response, control your response, okay? I have Josh with me. Um, I'm going to give Josh a chance to kind of share his story here. I met Josh several years ago. He's a veteran, um, and I won't spend time telling his story, uh, but he has a powerful story, and it's a story of hope, okay? And you heard our story, which is a, a, a painful story that, in, that didn't end up the right way. But there's also 23 million Americans in recovery. And we need to also embrace the folks that's in recovery because people do recover and they live active and productive lives, okay? And what we currently do is we demonize those folks in recovery and we never give them the real chance and the real resources, um, you know, to really let them be successful. So Josh is with me this evening and I'm gonna give Josh a few minutes here to kind of share his story and then we'll give you guys a chance to uh, ask us some questions. Josh? Like Travis said, my name's Josh. Um, I'm a 1999 graduate of Green High School. Grew up in a nice upper middle class family. Um, varsity letterman, 3.5 GPA, all that fun stuff. <clears throat> when I graduated high school, um, my parents, of course, had my road picked out for me, and that was college, and they were going to pay for it. Um, but that really wasn't good enough for me. I wanted to go to college, but I wanted to feel like I earned it, feel like I put myself through it. So in 99, I joined the Ohio Army National Guard. You know, one week and a month, two weeks a year was the plan. Um, and that went well um, until 2001 when the Twin Towers were hit. I got a phone call and they told me to pack my bags. They didn't know where I was going, but I was going somewhere. Um, so I had to withdraw from college. <clears throat> my first deployment, I stood in an airport for a year by the screeners, making sure nobody had any, you know, sharp toenail clippers, because that was a dangerous job. Um, but then in 2003, I got sent to Iraq. I uh, went with the 4th Infantry Division did the initial invasion of Iraq. I was the lead vehicle in the second convoy into Baghdad, and I was the lead vehicle in the first convoy into Tikrit, Saddam's hometown. Um, 
my convoy north was the only convoy that didn't suffer a fatality. So they put those of us that were in the front and rear vehicles of that convoy in charge of escorting high-risk convoys around Iraq. So it was a six-man team. We ended up driving 34,900 miles on those roads in nine months. Um, if you know anything about Iraq, that's really not a place you want to be is on those roads with the IEDs and everything like that. I was in the rear vehicle. Uh, my best friend ran the front vehicle. His job was, if something happened, to get the convoy out of the danger zone. And my job was to engage until the convoy was clear and then I could catch back up. While there, of course, I lost friends. Did that fun stuff. But I made it home. I made it home alive. When I got home, I went back to working at the motorcycle shop that I worked at and uh, tried to go back to school. I made it two weeks into my first semester back before I got in an altercation with one of my professors and dr dropped out. I couldn't figure out where I was or what was going on, but I was a wreck. I was drinking myself to sleep every single night doing anything I could, any risk-taking behavior I could to feel alive again. I uh, found a lot of comfort in my motorcycle, especially, you know, riding wheelies and running from the cops and doing things like that. And then one day I crashed my motorcycle and I broke both my wrists. They gave me two 20 milligram Oxycontin and eight Percocet a day for breakthrough pain. I can tell you that with two broken arms, that was the first time I slept through the night in two years since I had been home from Iraq. It was the first time I woke up feeling like myself again. I had energy, I wasn't stressed. And then the next night I went to sleep, again, no nightmares. I felt like the old me again. And that went on for two months until of course my wrists were healed. And then I went right back to having incredible night terrors again. Right back to waking up screaming, waking up sweating, not being able to sleep, being grumpy, being afraid to drive my car. And I realized at that point in time that, you know, those, those opiates helped. The painkillers helped. So, of course, I went to the doctor and told him, I slipped in the shower, I threw my back out, got some painkillers. I played that game for about a year, and my doctor wised up, and he said, you know, I think we have an issue. <laughs> and I said, yeah, like, I'm in pain, and you're not giving me any painkillers. That's the issue. So he refused to prescribe them for me. So I did what anybody would do. I went to the emergency room, and I got some there. Um, during this time, I had left my job at the motorcycle shop and I became a machinist. Um, while I was there, I was, of course, using opiates every day, and I was succeeding. I was promoted to first shift foreman after six months, and then within 12 months after that, I was promoted to quality manager and first shift foreman. I had 60 employees under me. It was a $15.5 million a year company. I was going places, but during this time, I couldn't get any more painkillers until I found out that one of my employees sold some. So that day, I started buying Percocet, morphine, Vicodin, whatever you can think of that he had, I bought. And I stayed on that train for about six years using opiates every single day. It's, you know, I thought, hey, it's working. Like, why not, why not keep going? Um, during that six year period, I had a horrible marriage and got a divorce and um, I ended up just spending most of my time with my best friend, who's now my wife. Um, but one day 
I had a problem. I couldn't find any more painkillers. And I was sick. I was dope sick. I couldn't sleep. I was vomiting. I had the worst pain that you could ever imagine. Sweating, chills. So I called off work. I missed two days in a row. Um, and I called my buddy, who is also my dealer, and said, did you find any? And he said, no. And I said, dude, I have to get to work. Like, I have to get to work, you know? And he said, I'll be over in a little bit. A half hour later, he showed up, and he had this tan powder. And I said, what's that? He said, dog food. I was like, what? But that's really what he said. And he said, it's an opiate. It'll help. So I snorted a little bit of it. Boom, I felt like a million bucks again. I was, before I headed back into work, because I said, well, I'm going to go work the next half of the day, I said, split what you have with me. So he did. I went to work, called him as soon as I got done, and said, hey, I need, a, I need more. And he said, no, you don't want to buy it. He said, you always told me that you would never do heroin. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, but that opiate helped. And he said, dude, that's heroin. And I was mad for maybe one one millionth of a second. Just one one millionth of a second. And I said, well, let's go buy some. And so that day I became a daily heroin user. I wasn't using to get high. I was using for what I thought was just to be normal again, just to be able to sleep through the night. While I was a daily heroin user, my best friend and I got married. We had been married for about a year, and uh, she knew. She didn't know it was heroin. I told her it was fentanyl because, you know, I was a high-class drug user. I only used prescribed drugs or medical grade. At least that's what I thought at the time. One night, I'm working late, getting ready for a shipment, and she calls me and says, hey, honey, what time are you going to be home? I said, I don't know, maybe a couple hours, and she's like, oh, okay, I was just wondering. I said, why? Because normally she doesn't, you know, sound anxious, and she said, I have some news I want to tell you. So I did what any patient person does, and I shut the shop up right then, and I went home. I went home, and my wife had this big smile on her face, and she hugged me and said, I'm pregnant, you're gonna be a dad. I was super happy for a minute, and then it sank in. Like, how the hell am I gonna be a dad when I'm a daily heroin user? I'm a daily heroin user, how the hell am I gonna be a father? So I spent the next nine months trying to do everything in my power to quit. I'd make it a day, two days, one time I even made it two weeks. When I made it two weeks, I was like, I got this kicked. It took one stressful day at work, and I called my dealer and had him bring me more drugs. I was using so much heroin at this time that I bought my dealer a used pickup truck so that he could deliver it to me at work because I was working 80 hour weeks. We found out that my daughter was breech, so my wife was gonna have to have a scheduled C-section. The night before the scheduled C-section, I purposely started a fight with my wife, and we don't, we never fought. But I started a fight with my wife and I made her go stay at my parents' house that night. I made her go stay at my parents' house that night for the sole reason of taking my own life. I tried to quit using and I couldn't. I hated the fact that I used, but my body craved it. Mentally, I knew I was smarter than this, but my brain didn't care. It didn't care how much I wanted to quit. So I proceeded to get heavily intoxicated, got my pistol out, and sat on the couch, cried a little bit, and uh, my phone rang, and it was somebody that I served with. And I was crying, I was an emotional wreck, and I said, you know, 
I can't talk, but goodbye. You know, no, I love you, brother, but I'm sorry. And his exact words were, I don't care if you blow your brains out. I saw a little person back there. Um, he said, but you owe me five minutes. He said, let me clear my conscience because we've already lost too many friends to suicide that we served with. He said, I don't want your death on my head. So I said, okay. And I sat there and I listened to him for five minutes and it turned into 10 and 10 into 20 and 20 into daylight. The sun was coming up and he told me now it's time to sack up and go be a dad. So I met my wife and my parents at the hospital. Um, we went in for the C-section. Um, my beautiful little girl was born. And then the doctors, you know, they take the baby away for like 45 minutes or an hour. I don't know what they do, but they definitely clean them because they come out nasty. Um, <laughs> trust me, I was like, it's silver. Uh, and at this time, my parents had went out to lunch, so I called my dealer. And I said, I need some more dope. He said, meet me on the top floor of the parking deck. Because I knew nobody would see me up there. Well, we went up to the top floor of the parking deck. I met him there. I jumped in his truck. I proceeded to bend down to snort some. And uh, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh. And I said, what? And he looked over, and my parents parked right next to us. Of all the parking spots, of all the floors, they parked right next to me. Like, I don't even know why they were up there. The walkway's on two. I was on four. Like, And so I hurried up, and I shoved it in my pocket. And I got out, and I looked at my dad. And uh, it's one of the images I'll never get out of my brain. My dad wasn't angry at me. Nope. He wasn't mad. He wasn't sad. It looked like I took the soul out of his chest and I stepped on it. It looked like I took his heart out and just ground it up. So we had a pretty silent walk in back into the hospital. They told us, the nurse told us that they were gonna be bringing the baby by in five minutes. So I did what any upstanding proud father would do. I went in the bathroom of the maternity room and I got high. I came out and I took the pictures with the baby and pretended like I was fine. My dad wouldn't even make eye contact with me. A little bit later, I don't know, once they took the baby back away for its little breaks, he asked if I would go smoke a cigarette with him. So of course I did. And when we went outside, he said, you know, this is my first grandchild. He said, and I have one, one purpose as a grandfather, and that's to protect my granddaughter. He said, you have one option, and that's to get clean. Or I'm going to take your wife and your daughter so far away that you'll never find them. And I knew he meant it. He has the means to do it, and I knew he would. So I said, okay. I said, okay, I'll, I'll get help, you know. So I went to the VA for the first time. They uh, put me in an intensive outpatient program. Uh, I took FMLA leave from work. It was like a 90-day program. You know, go there th three days a week for like four hours a day. And I was clean. So I got out of that program. And I stayed clean for the next three months. Uh, then I get a phone call. And my aunt had passed away. She lived in Michigan. And it was my favorite aunt in the world. Um, and so on the way back to her funeral, I stopped and of course I bought dope. So I relapsed. After I came back home, you know, everybody, everybody was looking at me, but they didn't understand what was happening. I had a 10 day long relapse. One night on the way to the dealer's house, I'm talking to myself and I'm like, God, how the hell, how the hell am I going to tell my family that I relapsed? Like I, I made it six months. How are they ever going to, how am I going to tell them? And, uh, 
That was June 13th of 2013, which is the best day of my life because I got arrested by the APD, Akron Police Department. They put me into felony drug court. Felony drug court said that I needed to uh, go to an intensive outpatient program. And I said, no, like that's not gonna work. So I went into a 30-day program at the VA and then while there, they diagnosed me with PTSD and a traumatic brain injury. They did one of those fun functional MRI things. When I got out of that, they put me in a four month long inpatient program for substance use and PTSD. I came out of there, started going to meetings, started meeting with other people that were in recovery. And I've been clean for five years, four months, 11 days now. It's not easy to stand in front of a group of people and say, hi, my name's Josh, I'm a heroin addict. But I do it because there's hope. There's hope for recovery. All we have to do is let, the, let those people know that they're worth it, they're worth saving. But we, as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, have to be smarter. We have to lock those drugs up. It's so, it was so easy for me, if I wasn't feeling good, to go to my aunt's house and go to her medicine cabinet and take five or 10 pills. She'd never notice. And we also have to stop sharing stuff on Facebook, like David at the dentist. I've seen it on Facebook how many times? Parents love taping their kids when they're high. Like, all we're doing is teaching kids that it's fun to get high. When really, when I was using, all I wanted to do was to die. I can't thank Travis and Shelly enough for the work that they put in. Trying to get the word out and education out that there is hope. And that's why I'm standing here, because I have hope that we can beat this thing. I look out and I see faces that I know that have beat it too. And it's an amazing feeling. It isn't a death sentence, but we can't keep sweeping it under the rug. And like Travis said, when you go to the doctor and you, or you go to the dentist and they say, here's 30 Vicodin, maybe just ask them for three or four. Don't risk it. You never know when that switch will flip in your brain. Other than that, I'm about done. Yeah, so let me, uh, let me tell you this about Josh. One of, the, one of the things that Josh didn't share with you is that he actually, and I, I teased Josh because he was in the Ohio National Guard. I was in the Marine Corps. Big difference, right? Big difference. But let me tell you about Josh. He actually won a bronze star, okay? Josh is an American hero. He is an American hero. Let's give him a round. So I got to know Josh a couple years ago, and, and uh, we became friends, and we kind of get out and kind of share our story and, and, and kind of get the conversation going a little bit. So um, where we're at right now is we would entertain questions from you guys, and if you have any questions or uh, things that we can be doing as a community um, or any of that kind of stuff. So it's up to you guys. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, w what we know is we have to constantly work on our sobriety, okay? We have to constantly uh, uh, work, work on that. So 12 steps, um, we gotta do whatever we gotta do. You know what I mean? But I think the other big part of that, though, is the pain, right? Because it's some form of trauma. In, in Josh's case, he was, he, he's actually at, what, 100% disabled right now, right? Because he suffered a traumatic brain injury, okay? And so, um, but it took a long time to figure that out, right? And so we got to, we got to understand that. Yeah. Questions? Concerns? Thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Are you willing to share your opinion on issue one? No. Okay. The answer is no. No on issue one. That's, that's, the, that's, that's me. 
And, and let me just try to explain that to you real quick. And there's some good things in issue one, and I don't want to act like there's not, okay? But what Josh will tell you and, and what I'll tell you is the work that we've done with law enforcement and judges, it takes a lot of their power to actually get people help. Josh will tell you the turning point felony drug court program saved his life. And if issue one passes, those kind of things are going to be taken away from the judge where he's not going to be able to get somebody into a treatment program. So based on that, Travis's vote is no on issue one. Okay? Yes, ma'am? Yeah, great question. So what's the cost to come into our facility? So as I said, we're going to pick up where traditional treatment leaves off, okay, in an outpatient setting. So uh, through IOP and relapse prevention, some of that is billable back through Medicare, okay, or Medicaid, all right? And then the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to charge a fee for people to use the wellness center, okay? So... People that can afford to pay it to come into the wellness center will pay a fee, just like you join the YMCA or your fitness club or wherever you go, okay? And then what we're going to do for people in recovery is we're going to have them on a sliding scale and put them in a fee that they can afford. Now, listen, I don't believe you can give it away because I don't think anybody values anything for free. But obviously, we have to charge them a fee that they can afford to pay. So what if you have somebody who's indigent? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where Medicaid and all that's going to come into play. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. The, the other part of our program is, as you guys heard, uh, Summit County donated 10 acres, and it's the former Edwin Shaw property, if you guys are familiar with it, uh, in Springfield or Lakemore. Um, the other part of our program is to come back with sober living homes in that, in, you know, on that property. And so the three things that I think we're missing uh, on the epidemic is long-term treatment. Treatment's 30, 60, 90 days. It's not enough treatment, right? Sober living homes. What we currently do is uh, we have a sober living home in downtown Canton or downtown Akron, two streets down from the drug dealer, and then we wonder why they fail, right? Okay, and then relapse prevention or wellness. Those are the three things that I think are, are that we have to fix before we're really going to start solving the problem. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, obviously. So it would be not up to the treatment facility for 90 days or whatever they would choose to go to. Yeah. So you're, are you saying they would choose to come into our facility? Yes. Yes. So they would... They would yeah, so they would be coming out of treatment, whatever their treatment that they did, 30, 60, 90 days, right? Um, and then they would volunteer to come to, to continue to work on their sobriety. Yeah. Um, and, and it's possible uh, that, you know, some of that with our work with the drug courts and so forth, some of that can be mandatory by somebody that's in a turning point program um, in an outpatient type setting like Josh. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so um, we, we didn't really model it off of any specific facility. We modeled it off of, a lot of this stuff is happening at different places, okay? But it's not happening at one place, you, okay? So you, you, there's, you know, there, what, what someone will tell you in recovery is, is the worst thing you can do is create a cookie cutter approach for someone in recovery, because everybody is unique, right? And so what works for you might not work for this person. So everybody in recovery, and the work we've done with folks in recovery, is we gotta be smarter than that. We gotta be able to create programs that are unique to each individual, okay? So we didn't necessarily model it off of um, a specific program that's already being done. We modeled it off of the gaps that our son fell in, okay? Um, and getting knots on my head, okay? Um, you know, I, I give you an example. Um, when Tyler died, we had exhausted our health insurance, okay? We had 21 days, two-time lifetime inpatient treatment. So Tyler got 42 days of inpatient treatment under our health insurance plan. And then we were exhausted 
financially because we put him into treatment. And at the time of Tyler's death, he was on a three-week waiting list in Summit County asking for help. During that time, he overdosed and died, right? So that's a gap, right? Look, I think everybody in the room would agree that you shouldn't have to stand in line when you want help. You should be able to go get the treatment you deserve, okay? Um, so we didn't really model off any specific program. Uh, we took lots of programs that are successful um, and, and, and trying to think out of the box and trying to come up with something different. And, and I think that's the key is sobriety is a long time thing. It's a forever thing, okay? And uh, everybody in here, and I know there's several folks in here that's in recovery, okay? They will tell you the most important day is today. The most important day is today. And, 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 and whether it's five years like Josh or somebody who has 25 years. So the stigma that's associated with this thing that we don't think this is in our town, we got our head in the sand. Because this is in every town, this is in every community, and it's an epidemic that's sweeping across our country. So the number one thing we have to do as a community is to have these kind of conversations. And so I commend uh, the school for giving me the opportunity to be here and getting these hard conversations going. Okay, because these are uncomfortable. This is an uncomfortable conversation, right? Um, but those are the things we have to start doing. So my challenge to you, and it's really, you know, I, I told you, you know, I sat in shame for five years because I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I thought I felt as a father. I didn't understand addiction as a disease. But look, if my son would have had leukemia, you think I would have, you know, I, I certainly would have told everybody. You know what I mean, right? But he had the disease of addiction, and I didn't understand it. So, um, you know, these are the kind of type of conversations we have to get going. Um, this is not an easy solve. There's lots of moving pieces, and I don't want to pretend to anybody in the room that we got the end-all, save-all answer, okay? But what we are going to do is think out of the box and do something different, because what we know we're currently doing, we're failing at 70%. Okay, we're failing at 70%. So if we don't cre create aftercare programs or relapse prevention programs, we're gonna continue to fail at 70%. And that's not good enough. So listen, um, you know, pride does a lot of things to you, right? And so I was typical prideful guy, right? And, and you know, so look, I blew it. I blew it. I made every mistake you could possibly make with this thing. And I can't change what's already happened. And so what I'm trying to do now is I can respond differently. And so if I can change outcomes for other families, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do, okay? I, I, I wanna leave you with this because I think it's important. We often get, you know, what do you do when you can't get somebody into treatment, right? Uh, you know, my son or my daughter's out there and or my family member's out there and I can't get them in the treatment. And that's a, very, that's a very difficult journey, okay? But I want to tell you this. I made every mistake that a parent can make in dealing with this. But let me tell you the couple mistakes that I didn't make. I never stopped believing in my son. I never stopped loving my son. And I never stopped thinking that he would be okay. So my challenge to you, if you have somebody out there who's struggling, that you want to get into treatment and they're just not ready and they're not going yet, don't give up on them, don't stop loving them, and don't stop believing in them, okay? Because that hope and that unconditional love will someday break through, okay? Um, and so I, I want to try to encourage you that way. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope, okay? Thank you guys so much for listening to Josh and I, and thank you for coming this evening. We appreciate it.